You'll see in this video what food, shopping places, nature and history you can expect to see in Verona. We visited four of the largest cities in northern Italy within nine days. We landed in Milan, took a train to Turin or Torino, went from there on to Verona, from Verona to Florence or Firenze, and from there back to Milano. Verona is actually even a UNESCO World Heritage Site because of its unique medieval architecture. And it is the second largest municipality in Veneto, the same region where Venezia or Venice is also located at the eastern part of northern Italy. The series is called How to Fail Dolce Vita because it is the Italian expression for sweet life in Italy. And we did definitely not experience a sweet as in relaxing time there. We really had to take in a lot of sour stuff that happened to us. You'll see what and why. We arrived in Verona in the afternoon and had a really hard time. We had to walk about 40 minutes from the main train station to our Airbnb apartment. The worst part was that I brought four times 1.5 liter water bottles with me that I tied to my luggage from Turin all the way to Verona. And the worst of all was, due to the immense pressure and the uneven asphalt, one of my wheels broke. I had to push the luggage and the water all the way in front of me to be able to move forward. We took turns, but my nerves were on edge. That luggage was brand new and already died in the first half of the week. How am I supposed to stroll around the city in the upcoming days? When we finally arrived in the apartment and could get the key, we just smashed our stuff into the bathroom, went to the toilet, rested for a couple of minutes and went out again at around 2.30 p.m. That was the most stressful trip of the week as we only had one day to arrive, discover and move on, which was the least of all the time that we've spent in Italian cities. It took us again about 40 minutes to walk from our place to the historical city center where the action actually takes place. It was already after 3 p.m. when we finally approached the first sign of the river Adige, which is by the way the second largest after the Po. It was very hot and we were so happy to finally see the romantic picturesque scene of the city that seemingly withstood the centuries passing by. The closer we came, the greater the excitement became. When we entered the historical town, our tiredness vanished into thin air. By the way, it was worth it to bring the water bottles the whole way after all, because we did not see any sign of a supermarket near our place nor the city center. Extremely weird. It was like Verona tried its best to look like it was still a medieval town. I've also noticed that there were no homeless people hanging around. I bet they were banned from this relatively small but highly touristy area. Also, we wouldn't have time to go grocery shopping anyways, as we started our day pretty late and still had too much to explore, as we would leave already Verona in the next morning. The marketplace in the city center square Piazza delle Erbe is only open until around 4 to 5 p.m. I'd say. We arrived pretty late in Verona so we managed to get something right when we entered the city around 3.30 p.m. Later on, after we visited Juliet's balcony, the stalls were already gone. So be prepared for that. Usually everything closes also at around 6 p.m. in a smaller city like this one. So be quick if you still want to grab a souvenir. We all know about the misfortune of the star-crossed lovers. Romeo and Juliet, the most famous play ever written by William Shakespeare. But few of us know that Shakespeare took his inspiration for the story and setting from Verona, the very same city we are in right now, and the rest is history. His story. Actually, it's not really his story. The story was already popular in the 14th century, 
and there are at least three versions written by Italian authors. It was very common to that time, since Italian stories were the most romantic dramas of all, to sort of copy them and translate them into one's own language. Shakespeare's version was also part of a trend among writers and playwrights of the time to publish works based on Italian novellas. So Shakespeare's version is actually an adaptation of the Italian Giulietta e Romeo by Matteo Bandello. The two families Montici and Capoletti and the struggle for power that took place in Verona during the 13th century is all true. There are still the houses of the two families today, nowadays of course called Romeo's house, which is sadly not open for visitors because someone else lives there right now. and Juliet's house, which is famous for its balcony, where it's now even possible to get married. Juliet's balcony. It really does make you feel like you're thrown back into that time, into the heartbreaking story. I mean, it would, if not so many tourists were lurking around here. We literally had like two minutes time on the balcony itself before the next girls would want to take our place. That's how an influencer must feel like. We have to move to the next location. Shoot, shoot, shoot! There are actually two other sites that are also pretty important around the balcony of Juliet. First of all, do you know the movie Letters to Juliet? It plays in Verona. It's a pretty popular romance movie starring Amanda Seyfried. The wall of the letters became known through that movie and it was actually relocated from the original wall because the letter tradition existed already but if you look at it, the wall itself is pretty ugly. So they put the letters directly at the house to make it look more picturesque. Also, there is a tradition where you should touch the breast of the statue of Giulietta. Yeah, I know, it's kind of weird. And there was even a Japanese old man who was like so not going to do that because he was like, oh my god, this is disrespectful. I also kind of feel that way, but the Italian saying says that you'll get lucky once you touch the breast. So if you want to try it out. Google Maps says it's right here. That's a joke, right? No entry! No wonder there's no crowd in front of it. Let's go somewhere else. How boring. This is this house, der Montague. Montague. Ja, ich denke, das ist ein Familienhaus. Und hier kann man seinen Brief für Romeo hinterlassen. <laughs> Spaß. <laughs> Juliet's balcony is not the only thing you can see around there. I recommend to you if you are interested into the history and the era of the 13th century where Romeo and Juliet takes place to visit the museum of the house of the Capoletti, which is right at Juliet's balcony. And I definitely recommend to you to pay the entrance fee and wander around the house alone due to the fact that this is pretty much the only site you must visit and where you can do and learn something. Also, it's not expensive. The normal entrance fee is around 6 euros. As a student, you pay 5. Besides, you can only go on the balcony if you pay the entrance. So. It is a pretty interesting museum that is made of the remains of the real house but you can see also how people in that era lived. It shows you furniture, clothes and literature from around the era where the couple was supposed to live in. And it is even possible to write your own letter to Juliet. In the museum there are some old PCs where you can type your letter and your email address. We did not get a response, but at least you could have wrote something to Juliet as it was tradition in Verona and yeah, it kind of gives you also the feeling of in the Hollywood movie that I mentioned. And yeah, maybe one day you'll get your answer. I 
ice cream tastes everywhere around Italy. Fantastic, since this is the country where it's originated in. I tried cinnamon. Find that flavor that I'm showing right here. The big question, what is the difference between focaccia and pizza? Focaccia is made with extra baker's yeast, which causes the dough to rise higher than that of a pizza. They are super cheap compared to pizzas. They only cost around 2 euros per piece and you really get full. Since focaccia is usually served as bread to accompany a meal, it is usually seasoned with only olive oil, salt and herbs. However, nowadays you can buy any topping on that. We also saw a lot of stores right at the entrance of the history historical town center and I can definitely recommend you for the quick hunger grab a focaccia and literally eat it on your walk because you can just hold it in your hand easily and they're so delicious there are many places where you can grab a delicious bite of pizza but I can definitely recommend you Berbere we came across it when it was already pretty late for the inhabitants of Verona, around 6 p.m. Most of the restaurants were either closing or not offering a takeout at that time. So we were lucky to have found this store because we were really hungry and this was our last chance to get any food before this day ended. Not only the opening times are great, but the flavors and the choices as well. Especially because they offer extremely unique flavors on their pizzas. Look at the menu. I took spec from Trentino, natural gorgonzola, acacia honey, walnuts, fior di latte mozzarella. I haven't seen anything like it in any pizzeria anywhere. And it was really delicious. We were in a hurry, so I had to gobble my food down my throat so that we could make it in time into the theater. What I definitely recommend you is to find that secret hidden staircase right next to one of the bridges at the Adige River. Sadly, I can't remember the name because I've never heard of it. We just found it spontaneously meanwhile walking. So just hike all the way up and believe me, it will be worth it. Because once you entered the highest point of the hill, you can view over all the beautiful sights and the city Verona. And I recommend you to go there just right before sunset, because that's what we did and we just watched the sun setting. Meanwhile, we sat at the beautiful bar, which is also located on top of the hill, and drank a white wine, because if you're in Italy, you should definitely try once a wine, even though you're not a wine drinker. Best one I've ever tasted in my life. Additionally, Verona lies close to the biggest lake of Italy, the Lake Garda. That's why it's also a popular place to stay. Here comes my special tip. Definitely visit Verona during the time that the interactive theater plays of Romeo and Juliet are performed. That is between June and September. It's called traveling performance because they're taking you to different locations. One is the stage right on top of Juliet's house. One is on the streets, one is at a private theater location. The first scene of the interactive play that we had to do as the audience. So we were basically acting as if we were in the house of the Capoletti in the ballroom. And the masquerade ball would take place as we were the visitors. And it was so weird for me because every man had to line up on one side and every woman had to line up on the other side and we had to make eye contact and just choose someone. So we just had to awkwardly choose our dancing partner and just dance for a few seconds with someone on the grounds of Juliet's house. And it was so delightful because even though I was a little bit anxious, we all had such a great time. It was possible through that performance also because it was so interactive and working with the crowd to enjoy Verona in a completely different perspective, to kind of travel with your mind back in time and really perceive the story of Romeo and Giulietta 
in a completely touching and close way and it was so much fun we had to laugh so often during the times we had to act as if we were the fighting families of the Montagues and the Capuletti but also it was so heartbreakingly sad to see the last famous scene of Juliet and Romeo dying for each other out of grief in their love. So it's safe to say I've experienced every possible emotion through that performance. It's so rare that you get the opportunity to experience something like this in life if you're not an actress or actor by profession. So the ticket is around, let me check, but it is such a great theater play, honestly. It's the best one I could have ever bought in my life, probably. Especially good for you to book ahead, because when we arrived there and heard of it, there were only tickets left for the Italian performance. So most of the time we didn't even understand what they were saying, because sometimes they would put a translator on the stage, but in the most scenes they would just be talking in Italian. And even though I didn't understand anything, luckily I was aware of the story plot, so it did touch me all the way and there was no words needed. That's what a good act actually needs. By the way, if somehow you don't want to book ahead online, you can just buy the tickets right there on the same day like we did. It's just right next to the Statue of Giulietta on the ground level directly in front of Juliet's balcony. I personally think that this spontaneous buy was worth more than anything in the city. The way back to the apartment, by the way was really a hassle. We've just missed the last bus right after midnight that would have taken our strained legs home. Fortunately, Verona is even still at night a calm and seemingly safe place. The exhaustion after we finally arrived home was now at its peak. We laid in bed and went to sleep at around 2am. The next morning was as exhausting as the last couple of days combined. We had to wake up after roughly 4 hours of sleep, pack our stuff, get ready and rush out the apartment pretty early as we had to catch our train at 7.30am. We left the apartment at 6.50. We still had 40 minutes to walk the whole way to the main train station. No matter how tired I was, I had to keep pushing my broken luggage because we couldn't afford to be late. The trains always departed on time and there was no money left for another train ride, which cost about 40 euros per person, so 80 euros for the both of us. The last meters we were sprinting into the station's hallway, looking at the display of train destinations, trying to find hours that would lead us to Firenze. As we couldn't find the Italian word for Florence, we started panicking. The train would leave in five minutes and we haven't even made it to the platform yet. Luckily, when I compared the train number that was printed on the e-ticket to the ones displayed, I could find ours. Firenze was only an intermediate stop, so it wasn't obvious to see as they mainly display the end of the line. So we literally stumbled into the train and found two comfortable seats. The moment we sat down, the train started moving. Relief couldn't even describe the feeling I felt. It was only replaced by the stronger one, exhaustion. We were hungry as we hadn't eaten breakfast and we craved for coffee as balm for our aching heads. If you want to know how the story went on, watch my next part. We will see each other in the city of Michelangelo and the Medici. If you like this video, please give me a huge thumb up and subscribe or you can just follow me on my Instagram account Naps Travel Diaries where you will see all my travel photography right at the moment where I'm on my travels and every update in my story. And you'll get to know tips and facts about where I'm traveling and philosophical statements or poetic quotes. So don't miss out on that.